love. It is my honor to welcome up Carlos Padilla eventually once he gets closer. Can we get up for Carlos? Thanks for the golf clap, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs> Keep it quiet in the library. How's everybody doing today? You doing all right? Woo. Yeah, it's kind of silent here. You know, I guess uh, Dave's hot chicken really did a number, huh? People are still in line. <laughs> it's funny, like, you know, <laughs> Chick-fil-A closes on Sunday so people could go to church. And just to think, Dave's hot chicken rolls into town and nobody's at church. What? But if you're watching, Cheryl, shh, thank you. <laughs> if you're watching online, thanks for uh, joining us. You just saw me shush my mother-in-law. Um, but yeah, welcome to the kingdom. We have a lot of fun here. I pass out these KFC buckets. It does not stand for Kentucky Fried Chicken. It stands for Kingdom Finance Collection. Amen. Awesome. Cool, cool. So, hey, welcome to the kingdom. My name is Carlos Padilla. And if you uh, just walked in today, you're going to get uh, some good info. Last week, we started um, a sermon series called The Kingdom, right? And if you look up kingdom, even if you go back to the etymology of the word, it simply means to walk in pace with. So, like, what's the kingdom of God? When, when Jesus comes up and shows up on the scene, the first thing he says in his sermons is, repent, change the way you think, because the kingdom is here. The pace of God is here. What he thinks, what he believes about humanity, how he functions, the government, the resources, everything of how God created the world to be is now at hand and is about to be restored. So, um, and then you see one of the later things Jesus talks about before he uh, ascends uh, finally and goes into heaven, whatever that means. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. But uh, the last things he, one of the last things he does is it says in Acts chapter one, verse three, is that he, um, he met with the disciples for 40 days and told them all things concerning the kingdom. Isn't that awesome? And then nobody chose to write that down, right? So, so it's funny because, I mean, Jesus comes and the first message is always the kingdom. You, very, you hear him very seldom preach a gospel of salvation, but what you hear is about the gospel of, king, of the kingdom. And he puts parables around that and says, the gospel is like a seed and the seed is the gospel of the kingdom. So the kingdom is a big deal. And it has a lot more than just the forgiveness of sins. It has everything to do about the restored image of humanity because Jesus came, amen? So let's talk about that today. We'll recap. If you weren't here last week, uh, we did part one called the original design. You know, it's very, very common in a church culture and maturity and discipleship that we uh, we climb that kind of maturity ladder of identity, then um, identity, calling, and destiny. And identity is who you are. Calling is what you have to give the world. And destiny is where you put it, right? But the thing is, if we just leave it like that, it's faulty by core. Because how many know that we just, if I leave it up to you to get your identity, you're going to get it based on the way you feel or maybe tradition or what someone tells you or societal kind of a a uh, repertoire of what that is, but long before we had an identity, we had a relationship, and that came before the beginning of beginnings, which was the origin, right? So what I'm trying to say today, too, is that it's good to have know who you are in Christ. It's good to know what God's been giving you, and it's amazing to be able to discover where God's given you to put what he's been giving you, but long before any of that, there's existed an origin, and this origin was a fellowship, a communion between the Trinity. You know, um, we have a gen. Most people have a what they call a Romans. I mean, Genesis three theology, where it's about the fall of man and sin, and then we we build our whole culture about. <sighs> trying to stay away from sin and trying to stay away from sin. And then some people get smart and like, whoa, in the beginning, we were created in this original innocence. In Genesis 1, it said that we were created in his image. And how many know you weren't created in the image of sin? And how many of you know that sin in the Greek is not just what you do or don't do or how you miss the mark? Sin is the blindness that blinded us from our origin. So when you see this conversation, you see a Genesis 3, which is sin conscious, Genesis 1, which is amazing, it's innocent conscious, but there predates even all the genealogies that you see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that tell you about Jesus' genealogy coming from the seed of David onwards, something that precedes that, and in John 1, it says in the beginning, in the beginning was the word, Jesus himself, and the word was face to face with God. So our our identification comes from our the origin. And this origin created us in his image without our faith, without our obedience. And actually, what gave us faith to complete the obedience of what he designed us to do was his breath. I mentioned last week that the first interaction that mankind had with God was a face-in-face -face encounter. 
Adam was there, and he was lifeless, and it said that God looked him in the eyes and breathed life into his nostrils. And when he awakened, the very first thing that he saw was the eyes of his creator, a face-to-face -face encounter, the same thing Jesus had from the beginning. So what are we called to do? What do we have? Where are we called to put it? But more importantly, let's not forget where we came from which is our original design. So let's talk about it today. Let's do a little recap. Last week, we talked about um, the next screen, the kingdom. And this is uh, the definition of the kingdom from my friend, Dub Alexander. The kingdom is the extension of the heart and the love and the authority of God from heaven through you. Next one. And because uh, we share in his image, we're created in his image, we have these built-in effects. Next one. And the effects that we went through last week that you find in Genesis 128 are, are these. Be fruitful, multiply, fill, replenish, subdue, have dominion, um, co-create, and deep communion. And we went all the way through dominion, but let's just recap those really quick. Is that okay? So let's go to fruit, be fruitful. So the first thing he does is God creates man in his image. Why? Because he knows that what works for him will work for man because he's created, he's created them according to his own kind. So what works for God in the world is it's supposed to work for mankind. And there's something special about us because God created us in his image. And he believes, Adam, what I do, the characteristics of my love, of the Trinity, of all these different things that we celebrated before we ever created anything, we're going to pass on to you because you're in our likeness. And because it works for us, it's designed to work for you. So the first one is to be fruitful, right? And it's not just have a thousand kids. It means to flourish, be productive. But more importantly, it means not to be barren. It means that everything you do will produce fruit in all seasons. Next one. The next one to be fruitful. The next one is multiply. It means abundance, not impoverished or lacking, to increase in power or influence, an overflow of production. When he's saying, dang it, Adam, if I'm fruitful and I multiply, you are too. And what, not only are you going to be fruitful, but you're going to multiply in abundance with that fruit. Next one. Then he said, calls them to fill and replenish the earth. And it doesn't mean to go and just, you know, knock a people side the head and force them into a relationship, but it means to fill or complete. How many know, like I said last week, that they were created in a garden, right? And the, 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 the main, the main uh, methodology for this is that they would encounter the love of God, see their origin face to face, and with the origin and the identity, they were to go fill the rest of the earth with that image. The image of innocence and everything, right? So it says, go complete and finish the earth. You know, in Habakkuk 2.14, it says that, that the world will be filled with the, with the glory of God. No, it doesn't say be filled with the glory of God. It says it'll be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God. So it's already there. We just got to become aware of it. And because of that, we can become agents for God's glory. Next one. The next one is subdue, right? And this means conquer to enforce victory, subdue, whatever doesn't look like the garden. So what are they called to do? Not only do they have the image, but because it works for God, it's supposed to work for them. And because Adam has the image, he's supposed to go and whatever doesn't look like the garden, he's supposed to subdue it. And this means, it doesn't mean the domination of people. It, and it certainly guarantees you not to live as a victim, but it's to get what he's given and introduce that to the earth and let the glory be filled of the earth, right? So next one. And then now we have dominion, right? To reign, to rule, to exercise authority, not dominating, but producing solutions, solutionaries for the earth to serve. And we are not problem focused. We are solution focused. So all that being said, God puts them in a garden and he says, whatever you experience with me, because you're in my image, the effects that work for me are going to work for you. So now you're supposed to extend the boundaries of this garden, the kingdom with my influence, with my, with, with our culture of what we have in the Trinity and go and spread that to the ends of the earth. You know, um, I'll just knock it right here in dominion. But the thing is, because we have dominion, doesn't mean that we go and just like overthrow people and just do things like that. It means that we serve. And because we serve, we have something to give. And because we're not problem focused, we're solutionary focused. And what all this means is that you don't have problems, you have opportunities. Because you've been given the kingdom, you're created in his likeness. You're supposed to reproduce, reproduce after your own kind. You're supposed to show up on the scene and bring solutions and not excuses. You know, it's common in the church, I mean, even in some of my little circles, that you encounter people who are in ministry and all they do is gossip and complain about other people. 
And I get that that's a problem, but you're called to be a solutionary. So I wish we'd spend more time praying for these people, introducing them to the gospel that's awakening you so we don't have that problem anymore. And that's what we're called to do, especially now in the city. I mean, we have pastors and people who are going through hard times and they don't need more rules. They don't need another church. They don't need another 501c3. They don't need a new building with a fresh start. They need the origin of what God knows them to be. So dominion, we're not problem focused. You don't have problems, you have opportunities. So whether it be in your workplace, whether it be at home with your kids, you don't have problems. You have an opportunity, an opportunity to glow as a light into the darkness. I know it's pretty shallow, but that's true. Next. So here's where we, we left off last time. So not only are we called to multiply and, and, and produce and, and fill and replenish and all those things, just as God does, we are called to co-create. Somebody say co-create. Okay, and the first thing man does after receiving the image is they co-create. They name creation. This is the first act of a person with the image of God. That they show up and they're to name everything. And to call them, it says, that they that he invited to call them. And call them just doesn't mean, oh, you're a tiger, you're a leopard, you're a seahorse, you're a whatever. It means to give it its function. So not only did Adam and Eve show up and say, oh, look, you're a tiger because you have stripes. He says, this is your function as a tiger. So what are we called to do because we've come from the place of origin? It's a sign and call people into their function. The first act as people with the image is a named creation. And it means to call them, to invite them, to help them define or to give place or function on. It's not just a name, but to invite creation into its purpose and function. That's what the gift of the prophetic is. You know, you're not... You're not you're not out there struggling with lost people. You're out there struggling with misinformed people. They don't know the truth. And, and you can adjust all the, all the symptoms and the problems that they have and keep them informed of that, or you can inform them about what's true and they just don't know it. It's the revelation, the unveiling of what's true. And we'll talk about that in a little while. So not only are we called to be fruitful, multiply, fill, replenish, have dominion, but we're called to co-create. Because you're in the image of God and he's a creator, guess what you're created to do? Create. And it's not limited to like paper mache and songs and lyrics. You're there to call things back into their identity. You're there to inform people that there's a bigger calling because there's a bigger origin that they don't know about. And when they can trust you with that and get in conversation with you, guess what? They can join that seat in high places too, where they can see face to face with God as Jesus was. Amen? So co-create. Let's go to the next one. Deep communion, right? So we're called to be fruitful, multiply, replenish, fill the earth, have dominion, co-create, and have deep communion. The first encounter with God, like I said, was a face to face one. Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. They had this unhindered relationship. And Adam saw nothing but God's likeness in himself before he ate the tree. Adam had a front row seat in the stadium of his heart for the beat of the Trinity with all of its resources, with all of its other-centered love. And he saw nothing but that likeness in himself before he ate of the tree. So I want to tell you today that these are the effects, next screen, of what's been given. Well, we can put it back into perspective too if you want, but <laughs> but because all this is true, these are the effects of the image that we're fruitful, multiply, fill, replenish, subdue, dominion, bring solutions, co-create, and have deep, deep communion with God. You know, it's funny because I think seven generations later after Adam, this guy Enoch shows up on the scene. And it says he walks with God. So even in spite of the fall of man, Enoch has a revelation of the restored image in Christ. And he brings that into that day and has fellowship with God. And not only that, he's raptured, if you want to talk about that. But that's what it is. And what had happened, it's just that Adam had somehow told through the pipeline that in spite of the fallenness of man, in their minds, that there preceded a relationship, a fellowship, a face-to-face -face encounter with God. And then seven generations later, you see Enoch walk with God in the cool of the day too. And yeah, that's awesome. So they walked together in the garden. And what were they doing? Deep communion. The image of God in you will allow you to have closeness and fellowship. 
I want to tell you again that Adam saw nothing but God's likeness in himself before he ate the tree. Next. So let's put this back into perspective, right? So, man, this is an amazing, amazing opportunity for Adam to repre- represent what he saw in fellowship, right? So he's called a subdue and all those beautiful effects. And then after he uh, does that, right before he's about to name these things, he looks around and in Genesis 2.18, it says, and the Lord said, it's not good for man to be alone. So I will make him a helper that's comparable to him, right? So think about this. Adam's there, has his assignment, subdue, multiply, do all these things. And it says that Adam was sad. And God sees his sadness And God's like, you know what? He can't do this without relationship. So he says, it's not good for man to be alone. And Adam walked in the garden and said, God, there's there's multiplied image of everything else. But when it comes to me, there's nothing like me. So what did God do? God puts him to sleep, pulls from his rib, and makes a beautiful woman to help him do all those things. And the foundation of the message is not only do you get to do things with God, but there's a relationship attached And what it does is it endorses the plurality of the trinity, of the origin. What it shows you is that God so loves relationship. That's why it was three in one. That what were they doing before they created anything was fellowship. Because you can't fellowship in isolation. So God was representing to mankind, even before they did all these tasks, that you were called to do this in fellowship. There's no singularity in this. When you look out, you're going to see the image of what I've created you to be. And when you see that image, it's going to remind you that we've never lost sight of our origin, which is the relationship. So to pull it back into perspective, before we get busy, subduing, multiplying, replenishing, filling the earth, having dominion, you know, doing all these things in our workplaces, don't do it at the sake of losing fellowship. It's not good for man to be alone. Next. So the image of God will allow you to have close fellowship. Next. So these are the built-in effects because we're called to subdue and multiply and all those things. This is what it looked like when they were given this authority, when they were charged to do these things. The built-in effects were they were supposed to be productive. They were supposed to be victorious. They were had governing solutions. They were co-creating. They had deep communion. They had fellowship with God. They had purpose. They had assignments. They had resources for those assignments and the capacity to reign like God here on earth. God created him his image, and he says, look at this. Because it works for me, it's going to work for Adam. And all these built-in effects were already in there. This is uh, the underlying thing. If we don't inform people about this origin or these built-in effects, they're going to try to earn them. They're going to try to earn these things. Like I said from the beginning, when Adam and Eve, when they had the breath of life breathe into them, To give them life itself, they did it without their faith and without their obedience, without their altar call. Actually, all the stuff that they were supposed to do to use these things was functioned by the breath of life. And it created this faith in them that says, man, if that's where the author and the perfecter of faith breathed life into me, it's not my job to have it. It's just a response to the faithful one. And you tell me to go subdue, to multiply I'm going to do that. And it's not based on my faith or my merit or my obedience. It's based on simple breath of innocence of life that was breathed into me without my cooperation. But if we don't give people that good news, they'll come to church, sit down, really love Jesus, have a sincere heart, and try to earn all these effects. And it's called dead religion. I know you guys have heard that from me. But these are the built-in effects, and this is what they enjoyed. Next screen. So then what happened, right? So they had this, they enjoyed it, and then obviously in Genesis chapter 3, something happens. Something changes in mankind's mind. So um, we read in Genesis chapter 3 that they ate of the fruit, and they went and hid, and God kind of deals with them, and um, they try to get these like fake coverings, and God says, no, 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 mankind can't repair itself. Mankind can't do it. He didn't come and upgrade their fig leaves and said, no, here you go. He said, no, 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 man." The sinful thing that just happened, the false identity you have yourself is beyond reparation. It needs death. So what he does is the shadows, he brings a tunic and he covers them. He covers them in the blood of the lamb. And we see that as a prophecy of what Jesus would do for all humanity. But the story is most, I guess, like uh, pl- plainly published in, in um, this is Romans chapter 1, verses 18. This is what happened in the garden. They enjoyed the fruit. They were there. They enjoyed the unhindered fellowship, and they ate, and things changed. And this is what it says in 
Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of man, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifested to them, for God has shown it to them. Then it says this in verse 20. Somebody say it with me. It says, For since creation, somebody say the word creation. So since creation, so it's not talking about just generic people living out the Israelites. It's saying in creation. So it's putting you back to tell you what happened to Adam and Eve. Let me get my amazing notes real quick. Sorry, it's just water. Um, so where are you? I should have highlighted in green, not pink. So what happened to the fall of man, right? So where are you? I spent so much time. Oh, here we go. So creation, right? Creation is a noun, obviously. And it's a Genesis, right? It says they were created uh, without, or they were without excuse, Adam and Eve. So this is what happened in the fall. Not only did they lose the fellowship, but they lost the image. And it says, for since creation, the world of the world, his invisible attributes were clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, and even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So Adam and Eve were born into this at a front row seat of his glory, his goodness, were charged to go multiply and do the effects of the of the garden and extend the boundaries of it. So they're without excuse. They had a reference. They had an origin. And it says, because although they knew God, they knew him. They did not glorify him as God. Actually, when you look in the, in the translation, this is usually um, italicized, so it's not there. So they didn't, defo- they didn't glorify themselves as God. They didn't choose to see what God saw in them. They had a different blueprint. They adopted some other type of identity. Nor were they thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they knew God. It's not talking all about history or in the Old Testament, but Adam and Eve knew God. They didn't glorify him as God. They didn't come to the same opinion or the same conclusion. They were like James chapter 1 where they looked in the mirror and they forgot what type of person they were. And they became hearers of the word instead of doers of the words. So it says in professing to be wise, what does that mean? It means the thought that they knew better. And they needed to know something else outside of God's provision. And they changed the glory of the uncorruptible seed, of the authentic image of the incorruptible God, into an image made like corruptible man and the birds and the four-footed animals and the creeping things. So what they did is that they, they were created as image at a front row seat and they lost the image. And because they lost the image of God, they lost the image of themselves. They thought that the, the cunning little serpent came in and said that there's something else that they had to know in order to be what they already were by grace. So what do they do? It says professing to be wise, that there's something outside the knowledge and the gift that God's given them, that they believed it. And they exchanged the image, it says. The image. What image? The original image. The original design, the original intent, the original fellowship. And because they lost the image, guess what was lost? The effects. So mankind's living in this blindness and and doing all these things. And that's why Jesus comes. But the next screen, please. So it was a bad exchange. And therefore, the very next verse is, Therefore God also gave them up to their uncleanliness and the lust in their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God and worshipped and served the creature. What's that? The serpent. We're in the garden, remember? Rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So they exchanged a truth of who they were for a lie that they had to be do something else to be what they already were. And then it says, and worshipped. You know, when, the, when, the, when you look at the word worship there, it doesn't mean that they didn't sing loud in church or have great worship songs or great tent revivals. Those are all great things. But when it says that they worship, it means that they came to a different conclusion. You see, you can worship in a bunch of different ways. I'm super glad that you do. But the word, the true worship that God is looking for is agreement. It's those that when lies come to them, they can still agree with what's true in their origin. So what does it look like to worship today? 
Does it look like flags? Does it look like notes and music? Does it look like even community? Yes, it, it can be all those things. But what we're really trying to get after is not losing agreement with God. Not believing the lie, not trading the lie for truth. Remember, it's exchange. They had one image and they exchanged it for another. And when they exchanged it for, for the other, the image was lost. So guess what? All those beautiful effects of resources, purity, productiveness, fruitfulness, multiplication. Because they took their eye off the ball, they had a false center that produced a different type of fruit. Does that make sense? All right, cool. Next. So this is the mirror translation. I think it knocks it out of the park of what happened in the garden. Because remember, they're creating innocence. They're creating with all these amazing things and the resources to do it. And then they chose, they traded the truth. They exchanged truth for a lie. And now because it came from a different origin and a different conclusion and actually severed their knowledge from God's knowledge, we, they produce different effects. But it says this in the mirror. Romans chapter 1, this is verse 18 to 25. It says, God is not standing neutral to mankind's indifference. The revelation of God's belief in our redeemed righteousness is at the same time an unveiling of God's passionate desire from a heavenly perspective towards humanity who seem to be lost, to have lost touch with a romance of their devotion by suppressing the truth about themselves. They exchange the truth for a lie. They have forgotten the delicate art to adore and be adored. While they continue to hold on to an interior reference, an inferior reference of themselves by being out of sync with their true likeness. Passionate desire. Go back. Thank you. <laughs> a heavenly perspective towards a humanity who seem to have lost touch with the romance of their devotion by suppressing the truth about themselves, that they have forgotten the delicate art to adore and be adored while they continue to hold on to an inferior reference uh, of themselves by being out of sync with their true likeness. So something changed and it wasn't God. It was their minds, right? Next. So verse 19 says, God is not a stranger to anyone. Whatever can be known about God is manifested in man. God has revealed it in the very core of our being, which bears witness within our conscience. God is on display in creation. The very fabric of visible cosmos appeals to reason. It clearly bears witness that every present sustaining power of intelligence of the invisible God, leaving mankind without any excuse to ignore him. Yet, mankind only knew him in a philosophical, religious way from a distance and failed to give him credit as God. They're taking him for granted, and lack of gratitude veiled him from them. They, came, they, they become absorbed in the uselessness of their debates and discussions, which further darken their understanding about themselves. Their wise conclusions only confirm their folly. Man, their losing sight of God made them lose sight of who they really were. Their losing sight of God made them lose sight of who they really were. In their calculation, the image and likeness of God became reduced to the corrupted and distorted pattern of themselves. Suddenly, a person has more in common with the creepy, crawly things than with their original blueprint. So they lost the vision of God, so they had a, a fake version of themselves, and they tried to replicate God in the fake version of themselves. So they had all these beautiful things, this amazing job to do, and innocence, and they fell. And because they lost that, they lost their identity, they lost the image, and because they lost the image, so the effects too were lost. Next. It seemed like God abandoned mankind to be swept along by the lust of their own hearts to abuse and defile themselves. Their most personal possession, their own bodies, became worthless public property. The truth surpassed I mean, the truth suppressed became uh, preferred the deception of a distorted image of their own making, religiously giving it their affection and worship. The true God is the blessed God of the ages. He is not refined by our devotion or indifference, and all because they traded the true God for a fake God and worshipped the God they made instead of the God who made them, the Message Bible says. By being confused about their maker, they became confused about themselves, what led to a whole manner of different obsessions. And it lays those out. 
The thing is, they lost the root, so the fruit just took another turn. Next. Yeah. So what are some of these lost effects, right? But what is the fruit of these lost effects? Because they tra- exchange the truth, because they exchange the truth for a lie and adopted a different belief system, a different conclusion. Now they were going to bear different fruit. And what are these lost effects? Well, religion. Trying to do something to make yourself more pleasing to God. Trying to do the makeup test. Poverty, selfishness, pride, murder, abuse, corruption, inequality, racism, elitism, exclusivity, insecurity. Now the liar becomes the prince of the earth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. And they forfeit the capacity to reign for and like God. Remember the effects that they're originally given, they had the capacity to reign like God would. They had the capacity to believe that work God would work for them, but they got disconnected from the vine, so it was starting to produce different, different fruit. You guys all right? This is good news. <laughs> Next one. So when the image was lost, so were the effects. Because they believed a lie, they, their point of reference now was from a lie. It was a blindness. And then you see when Jesus comes in, uh, in the Sermon of the Mount, his first sermon, Everything has to do with seeking first, changing your vision. If the body is flooded with light, if your eyes single, it'll be flooded with light. It's all about seeing things different. And it comes to restore what was lost. Next. They adopted a false image of God, so they embrace a false version of themselves. You know, I say this all the time, but the biggest idol we have is not like dressing your kids like SpongeBob on Halloween. It's not, it's not like uh, Medusa statues or, or Buddhist little carvings. The biggest idol we have is a false version of ourselves. But when we get to know the creator through the gospel of Jesus Christ, you begin to see what the creator is really like, so you start seeing what's been redeemed in your image. Next. Cool. So the image is lost, things weren't working out, and then... The solution before the answer appeared, Jesus Christ, right? And he had to redeem what was lost, you know? And the Bible says that he came to save that which was lost. Not who. That. What was lost? What was the that that was lost? The kingdom. The image. And guys, when the that gets found in the church, the who will get found by byproduct. When the that gets found, the who will get found by accident. Gosh, I should preach that one a little better. (laughs) Right? So man had to be redeemed. Something had to happen, right? We're in this perpetual blindness, and there's been shadows through the Old Testament pointing to that. Someone's going to come and adjust these broken lenses that Adam and Eve had given you, and this is how it happened. So this is in the mirror translation. This is uh, Romans 8, chapter 2, to verse 4, where Jesus comes in the likeness of the flesh by love. What it says, it says, the law of the Spirit is the liberating force of the life of Christ. This leaves me with no further obligation to the law of sin and death. The spirit has superseded the sin and slave senses as the principal law of our lives. The law of the spirit of righteousness by faith versus a law of personal effort and self-righteousness, which produces condemnation and spiritual death, which is the fruit of the do-it-yourself tree. Number three, the law failed to be Anything more than an instruction manual. It had no power to deliver us from the strong influence of sin. And remember, it just wasn't the the sins that they were committing. It was the blindness, right? Holding us hostage in our own bodies. God disguising himself in his son in this very domain where sin ruled in the flesh. The body he lived and conquered in was no different to ours. Thus, sin's authority in the body... In the human body was condemned. The very righteousness promoted by the law is now realized in us. Our practical day-to-day life bears witness to the spirit, inspiration, and not flesh domination. Praise God. You see, Jesus came into fallen humanity and chose not to be fallen. He endured every pain of rejection, of being misunderstood. It said he came to his own and they didn't recognize him. But he came to them, and the biggest persecution wasn't just the crown of thorns or the cross. It was that people, he came to his own, the image that needed to pull them out of whatever they were in, and they denied him. 
So it didn't start in the garden. It started when he was a baby and the misunderstanding and him getting kicked out of different synagogues and being threatened and all these different things. But he came and he entered in the state of Adam, in the state of you that you were born into. But he remained not to be fallen. Next one. So Jesus came in the likeness of Adam's fallen nature, but chose not to be fallen. Next. But this is fun. Because in, um, in Romans chapter 8, it says, For those God foreknew, that he already knew this God, and he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. How many know that um, Adam was your universal representation at one point? And then Christ came as the last Adam and became your universal representation. That's good news. What does that say? It says, by one man's act of disobedience, all were made unrighteous. That wasn't your fault. But by one man's act of obedience, all were made righteous. That wasn't your fault either. And that's not to your credit. It's to his credit. So the word means all means all. And God foreknew this. And he knew that they were in a fallen state. So he had a solution because he's a God of dominion. He didn't say, oh my God, we have a problem, angels. Let's round them together. Let's get in a huddle and see what we're going to do about this. It says before the fall of man. That the lamb was slain before the, the foundation of the earth, before creation. That there already was an answer. And the answer was that we'd be conformed to the image of the son. So that he, that he would be the first born, born among many brethren. And then in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 it says, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Remember, God produces after his own kind. And he sends Jesus a new lens, a new, the Savior himself to come and repair man's blindness. But it says that he came as the first fruits. You know, back in the Old Testament, when the first fruits was a huge thing, it's like if you had barley, what was the first fruit? Barley. It reproduced after its own kind. So Jesus comes and annihilates the whole to-do system. Fixes man's blinders, takes out a sin, not counting their trespasses against them. And now he's saying, what Jesus is like, you're the first fruit of that now. So as he is, so are you to the world. So Jesus comes, he enters man's blindness, and what Adam lost, Jesus comes to restore the image. And he comes to put it in your face so clearly that you couldn't miss it. And the only way you'd miss it if you had the blinder still on, or if you haven't heard the good news. So, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits for those who have fallen asleep. That means what Jesus did on our behalf, we get to be called the first fruit. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Next. So, what does this mean? Practically. In Romans 8, chapter, in ver, Romans chapter 8, verse 19. Or 18. Verse 21 and 21, it says this. And I consider that our present sufferings are not comparable to the glory that will be revealed in us. Wow, revealed, unveiled in us. Does it mean it's not there yet? It means it's there waiting to be unveiled. That creation waits in eager expectation for the revelations of the sons of God. You know, Jesus shows up on the scene and he walks on water. And he didn't do it to show off. It was simply the restored image of mankind and having the earth respond to a son. You see, the world is waiting for us to get the revelation of sonship so it can respond to us. Jesus has loaves and fishes and he multiplies it. And it's not because he's trying to show off. It's simply creation responding to the dominion and the subduing of a son or a daughter. So it says creation is groaning in heavy expectation for the sons and daughters to reveal. Creation is groaning in heavy expectation. They're waiting for you to wake up to the revelation of your sonship. They're waiting for you to endorse, embrace, and discover the newly restored image that Jesus came to die for. He came to take off the blinders on humanity. So now all the effects that were lost are now restored because he came to restore the image. Guess what? Now the, image, the effects of that image are restored. But if you don't have the good news showing that this is already done, you're going to try to earn it. And you're going to build religion on it, and you're going to make a lot of money doing so. Because <laughs> it does. For the creation was subjected to futility, but not by its own wills because of us, but because of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Man, there are plants and rocks and 
things waiting to serve you. You see, before in the garden, all these things were jumping to serve Adam and Eve before they fell. Everything was crying out to them. What do you need? We have resources. We see sonship. Just tell us what you need. And then that was lost. And then it becomes redeemed through the son of God. And now creation is there saying, we want to see sonship so we can give this. Did you know? Where you work, your school districts, there are resources waiting to serve you. The earth is designed to serve sons and daughters. The resources are there. The thing is they don't see sonship where they can sow into. So whether you're a doctor, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a pastor, whether you're, you're a stay-at-home mom, whatever that is, that there are resources all around waiting to serve you. Why? Because you have the kingdom inside of you. Why? Because you're a solutionary now. You know, you can walk into your school district and be with superintendents, and while they're tripped up on X, Y, Z, you have a solution that they need. Why? Because you have a sphere of influence. Why? Because you have the Holy Ghost inside you. Why? Because the image has been restored. But to the, fe- to the level that you believe it is the level will benefit you. So creation is waiting for the sons and daughters to be revealed. They're waiting with resources, waiting to serve the vision as it was before they fell. Next. Ooh, man, I'm sorry. Can somebody read that for me? Out loud? Not in your hearts? <laughs> Just pray in your hearts, brother. <laughs> somebody read that for me. What does it say? Thank you very much. That is so true. I wish I had my notes a little more organized. So literally, I don't know how literal that is, but yes, literally, waiting for you to become convinced of who you are. They have these stomach pains. They have these birthing pains. Plants, when you walk by, you're like, man, just show me sonship. There's trees that are dying that are waiting for you to walk by so they can resource you. There's harvest in your fields even in times of despair and in famine that are waiting to bloom. Next. People with the image give earth a context in which to function. You have every resource at your disposal. They're just waiting to respond to sonship. They're waiting to see that you believe in the redeemed image. They've seen the broken image long enough, and they know it, but we don't know it. Next. Let's just go to the next one. I don't need to get me started on that. <laughs> We're called to bring heaven to earth, but that's more than a prayer. It's a lifestyle. <laughs> so let's get practical real quick, right? This is how you do it. Adam and Eve mess it up. Jesus comes and redeems it. And now you have no excuse because you've been face-to-face with the Father. You have that same view, that same um, seatedness, right? To see it with the Father and the Holy Spirit and the Son have always celebrated, right? The, the identity, the origin, the calling, the purpose. Let's go to the next one real quick. But how does this work out, right? And right here, this, this scripture right here will get you kicked out of church if you preach a gospel like this. You'll be called an inclusionist or a what it's with a universalist. But this is how Paul preached the gospel because he had a revelation of the redeemed image. He knew that the effects were void and he was in that system. But then he got knocked off a horse, got introduced to God and the true him, and he had a different message. And he said it's by grace, not through works. So he shows up and he has this new revelation. And it says this, and he shows up in Athens at Mars Hill. And it says this. So Paul stood in the midst of whatever his name is and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects, that you have some type of commitment to a belief system. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, he's walking through the street scene with that temple and statue. Interesting, interesting. Athens, right? He's walking through the streets and says, I also found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. He's walking through, seeing all these temples, and he sees this one temple and says, it doesn't have a name. Oh, no, it's to the unknown God. 
And then he says, therefore, what you worship in ignorance, because you don't know, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made them from one man, every nation of mankind, of mankind to live on the face of the earth. You have an origin. I get that you worship this or you worship this, but we all come from the same origin. And let me redirect to you this. Let me give you the good news. Let me reintroduce you to the origin. And it says, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him. Though he is not far from each one of us, He's telling these heathen, non-believers, never heard the gospel, going in this temple one day, going in that temple one day, going to the unknown temple one day. He finds out the unknown temple and he says this, that though this God that I'm telling you, the origin who created everything is not far from you. For in him we live, we, all of us, me, you, pagans, we live and move and exist as even your own poets have said. For we also all are his children. Next screen. Being then children of God, he's telling people who haven't said the prayer yet, who haven't been baptized, who haven't thrown up their hand, who haven't come to the altar. He's saying, being then children of God, we ought to not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and the thought of man, the fall of man. They adopted a different image. It's not about that. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should change the way they think, find a different origin, and guess what? It's here, and I'm proclaiming it to you. You may have been lost. You may have been having fun doing X, Y, Z, but there's an origin that's known you before you've known it. And now this church isn't the, for the unknown God anymore. It's the God of origin, the creator himself, where you can only find in Jesus Christ. Because he has fixed a day where he will judge the world in righteousness through a man in whom he appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him, proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others, we shall hear you again concerning this matter. So Paul went out of their midst, but some men joined and believed, among whom were also that guy and that guy and a woman named Damaris and others with them. So Paul shows up and he's like, I got the solution for you, man. You guys are confused. You don't even know the name of this God. I got the God for you. He's the God of origin. And in you, he moves and has his being. And another translation says, you are the offspring of God. Imagine having an evangelism track that says, go out. No, they can't be. They can't have God in them. They're not believers yet. They haven't been baptized. They're separated from God. Paul doesn't preach that gospel. He shows up to unbelievers, pagans, who are maybe sacrificing children in this culture. And he says, no, you're his offspring too. I'm bringing the redeemed image to you. And you don't know what you worship because you don't know the one who's to be worshipped. So what does this mean in our workplace? What does this mean in our schools? That we stop seeing people as clean and unclean. Well, I don't even know if they're a believer. They're probably not following the Lord. That's not the problem. The problem is they don't know the Father. They know him as a judge probably through your conversations. <laughs> the most powerful thing you can tell someone who's in dismay that hates God is like, it's okay, man, I get it. And maybe the church has something to do with that. And I apologize that. But I want to let you know that in you, he moves and has his being. And you've heard about it through philosophers and even your poets that we're all the offspring of God. Paul would be kicked out of every church for preaching the gospel like that. So next one, and I think we'll just wrap it up here. Very good. That's cool, cool. All right, welcome the kids. Speaking of the offspring of God, All right, just real quick, I'll finish with this. This is in a, this is actually in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. I put the wrong address there. 
But it says, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds of the God of this age is blinded. You see, the devil keeps you blinded from this. He has no power, but through your ignorance, he'll keep you blinded from it. Who do not, be who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, it's the light of the gospel. It shines light on the original image that's been restored. Do you understand that? God's not waiting to restore the image. He already has in Christ. Everything that man can accomplish has been done in Christ. He's waiting for us to catch that revelation. What he's saying is that the God of this age is actually religion he's talking about, not the devil. The do-it-yourself system, the fall of man deluxe, has blinded you from seeing that you've been adopted into that. But guess what? You've been readopted into this new image. Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but we preach Jesus Christ the Lord and ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Right here, verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels. Paul showed up to Mars Hill and saw treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellence of the power of God may be, be of God and not of us. You see, the thing is, man, when you're walking around, go ahead. No, no, it's good, it's good. We can do it, yeah, we can do it now. See, when you see people who don't know God or people who are just conflicted about the nature of God, they're treasure. And like I always say, treasure is not real when you start agreeing with it. Treasure's always there waiting to be unveiled. And people were just veiled up because of the systems of the world or the fall of man deluxe. But now you are carriers of the restored image of God. That you are the ministry of reconciliation. And the message isn't that you can be reconciled. It's that it's already happened. And you can experience that reconciliation and enjoy salvation now. So, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels. It's waiting to be discovered next so let's pass communion around real quick amen usually i've been on guitar right now and it makes it really holy but <laughs> amen oh hello jesus so this is the this is the totality of everything man had it Adam had it, Adam lost it, Jesus redeems it. And because this is what it is, you are the solution, guys. You are the solution. This is what the totality, if you hear anything today, if you want to take a picture of anything, do this. The answer to every crisis and broken system becoming, is becoming aware of the restored image, the good news. Restoring the broken image restores the original effects. So people can't produce the images of God without knowing the image of God, without being, whatever. Guys, the game is rigged. This life on earth is rigged. It's already won. There's no more dangerous pieces, no more shoots and ladders. This game is rigged. The awakening to the restored image or the in Christ revelation is the key to God dealing with mankind. It's the pin code to restoring the effects. So does everybody have a communion? Can we pass communion out over there? All right, cool. So every weekend we take communion here just to kind of remind us of the truth. Thank God. So let's just stand real quick and take communion. All right, so we uh, let's take this with the children's. Woo, you, you got one? Oh, they already did communion. Praise God. You guys are light years ahead of us. Amen, God. So we thank you for your body, Lord. 
that was broken for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you didn't come to restore a faulty design, but you sent Jesus in the flesh. You came in the flesh to restore the image that was lost so that effects could affect the rest of the world. So we break your bread, reminding us that the truth of this word, and we eat that in Jesus' name. Mm. Amen. And then we take the wine, the blood. Mm. And we thank you, Lord, that um, this thing was lost at a meal when they ate the fruit. But then it was redeemed at a meal at the Last Supper where he said, this is the blood of my new covenant. So we thank you, Lord, for your body and your blood for the blood of the Lamb that cleanses us, heals us, and brings us just into revelation of your goodness and the restored image. Drink. Amen, amen. Well, thank you guys for coming out today. We usually hang around. If you guys need prayer, come to the front. We'd love to pray for you, for healing, whatever you need. Let's get let's get it done. Well, thank you guys for coming. We'll see you next Sunday. And um, we're going to talk about faith next Sunday. So we'll see you. Peace.